But of course, one of the things that we've really started to talk about in the last couple of years is the notion of user-generated content and non-fungible tokens. We're now going to take a deep dive into this with our next speaker, Alan Evans from Freeverse, who is going to be looking at living assets, evolutive NFTs for playing fair in the metaverse. Uh, good morning, everyone. Let's start today's session with a question. Um, hands up in the audience if you have heard of Marmite. That's quite a lot of people. Keep your hands up if you like Marmite. Around about half the hands go down. So if you're not familiar with Marmite, it is a condiment. You spread it on toast here in the UK. It's definitely not Vegemite, that's what the Australians do. Um, and you either famously love it, like me, or you hate it, like my wife. And uh, the interesting thing is that the Marmite uh, branding and marketing campaign make a big joke about this, right? So all the adverts about Marmite are love it or hate it. And in the games industry, we've seen our fair share of Marmite moments, right? So we've seen, you know, virtual reality goggles, love them or hate them. Uh, the free-to-play movement, right? Love it or hate it. Uh, Console wars, love them or hate them. Uh, even the video game industry itself is a Marmite movement. Everyone in this room probably likes the video game industry, but there are plenty of people out in the world that don't like video games, just like they didn't like uh, home cinema, just like they didn't like television, just like they didn't like cinema, and they probably didn't even like the book to start off with. So here we are in 2022 now with our latest Marmite moment, which is, of course, the non-fungible token or the NFT. I'm lucky to be a part of a WhatsApp group for indie game developers where I live in Barcelona. And uh, every few days, the chat goes bananas with endless debate about NFTs. And this was a nice image I saw that came up, a little parody of a, a scene from Terminator 2 about what one developer really thought was, was you know, the devil's spawn, right? And, uh, but the cold hard fact is, as uh, one of the colleagues, one of my colleagues in the talk a couple of about half an hour ago mentioned that there's just a lot of money going into this right now. $21 billion was spent on NFTs in 2021. And uh, like it or lump it, it's definitely something that's happening. There's a lot of money there. So what I wanted to do today basically was to just deconstruct a little bit, clear up the confusion about what is an NFT? Why would you want to own one? Uh, why some people are not fans of them and why perhaps they potentially could uh, have a, a great future ahead of them. So let's start with this and let's clear up some um, interesting points about what is an NFT. And let's start with what an NFT is not. So an NFT is not an image. This is probably the biggest misconception that people have about NFTs is that they think an NFT is an image. Uh, this was a, a photo that was, or an image, a drawing that was made by the uh, British comedian, John Cleese who drew on a piece of paper and then said, there you go, it's an NFT of the Brooklyn Bridge, right? And it's probably the biggest misconception. You can associate an image with an NFT, right? But an NFT is not an image. An NFT is absolutely not any sort of guarantee of IP rights. You might have read the, the funny story about um, some cards who um, purchased for quite a lot of money the NFT of the Lord of the Rings book, thinking they could monetize that in the metaverse, right? And of course they didn't. Just because you own an NFT does not give you the IP rights to whatever that, uh, that NFT represents. And in fact, those of you who remember one of the, some of the original sort of NFT boom uh, stories of which, or applications, which was CryptoKitties, the license that was associated with your little digital cats meant that you were only allowed to actually physically print out the image associated with your CryptoKitty at a maximum size of A4 paper. So every good NFT has uh, a license, uh, some terms and conditions that are attached to it, and just owning an NFT does not give you any other rights. I have some sympathy with this third point. Some people think NFT is a, a receipt of purchase. In the same way that if I buy something in the real world, a receipt proves that I am the owner, right? But in this case, the NFT is the item you're buying, right? It's not just a receipt. The fact that you own it means uh, it's more than just a receipt in that sense. And the other thing I want to put to bed as well is that they're bad for the environment. Some, Bitcoin, uh, some blockchain technology, sorry, particularly the, the early stuff, the early Bitcoin blockchain network uh, is bad for the environment, right? In the sense that it uses a lot of energy and we're, no long, we're far from being carbon neutral at the moment. And so I think uh, the blockchain network I saw was, uh, sorry, the Bitcoin network was uh, using the same amount of energy as Argentina or something. But the simple fact is that if you mint an NFT on one of the modern layer twos of blockchains like uh, Polygon or Solana right now, it will 
cost the same amount of energy uh, as the power taken to, uh, you know, or the energy used to power this uh, um, presentation, this uh, projector, since I started my talk. So uh, the idea that, that they're all energy wasting things is, is, I think, it should be put to bed so quickly. So let's talk about what an NFT is. And this is an NFT. That's it, right? It has a unique ID, it has an owner, and it has some properties, right? And that record is written to one of the blockchains where it stays there forever, right? There is no images, there is no licenses, there is no anything, that's just an NFT. It's not a particularly fun NFT, it means meaningless. So let's add it something, and let's make a bad NFT, right? So a bad NFT retains the ID, of the, the individual ID of the token, it retains the, the address of the owner, which is anonymous, and it has here in its data field a link to a private server, right? This is bad, why? Because what happens on some private server is not reflected in the blockchain. The blockchain knows nothing about what's happening on a private server. That private server, whether it's a game server or whatever it is, it could, uh, be, it could be taken down, uh, it could be hacked, it could be, uh, you know, it could crash, you know, and if that happens, all the data associated with that NFT therefore disappears, right? That's not so good. So this, and apologies for the sort of code in the talk, but this is what I would consider as a good NFT, right? So it has the ID, the unique ID, it has the owner, and here we have a selection of properties that describe that NFT, right? This NFT is clearly Bob the Builder. He has some fields, right? He's very strong, strength of 42. And a couple of things I want to point out here. Yes, there is an image associated with that NFT, right? That image is stored on what's called the IPFS, the International uh, the Interplanetary File Server, File System, sorry, right? Which is a decentralized file network, which you can store any file essentially forever, right? It also has a license that says explicitly what you are allowed to do and not to do, right? And so at a slightly technical level, what we do is we associate an image's hash with that NFT. And we say that this image, these two images look identical, but one of them has one pixel, which is very slightly differently colored. So they are not identical. And therefore, their summary, their hash is very, very different. So if I associate an image hash with an NFT, I'm linking that image with that NFT forever. What can I do with that image? I associate the license with there as well, right? I associate some terms and conditions. They might say um, that the owner of this NFT has the right to access or engage or play with certain content within a game. It might say, might specify very specifically that any images or data or intellectual property are, are still uh, copyright the original game creator, right? So as the creator of the NFT, I have the freedom to associate any terms and conditions that I want with that NFT. And those terms and conditions, if they're well written, will guarantee what that NFT can and can't do. All right. So if we've got in our head a little bit what an NFT actually is and is not, why would you want to own one? This is a picture of my bicycle. Uh, it's a Lapierre Zesty. I like my bicycles. Uh, I bought it last year, and I now have the freedom to sell it to anybody I want for whatever price I want. Uh, I could probably make a profit on it now, right? Because I don't know if you know, with the whole COVID thing, there is a... Um, a slowdown in the in the availability of bicycle components. And so new bikes are quite hard to come by. This one's quite hard to come by. If I sold it on the secondhand market, maybe I could even turn a profit because it's, you can't buy it in shops. I can't do this in a video game. If I buy an item in a video game, I am not allowed to sell it onto anybody else for real money. Apart from the monetization debate, apart from the structure and the economy of the game, the real reason this happens is legal. It's actually legislative. If a game, is permitting um, the sale of in-game items for real money, they are storing on their servers, they are being the custodian of items that have real value, real money value on their servers on behalf of others. And therefore, legally, they have to become a bank. They have to comply with banking legislation. And so, in fact, Second Life even set up a whole spin-off company called Tilia Pay to do exactly that, to become a bank, to enable uh, Second Life users to trade their uh, Second Life gold for dollars, right? So what the blockchain does and what NFT does is abstract that responsibility of the bank. And it allows gamers or allows users to sell items to other people for real money. And why shouldn't I be able to do that as a gamer? Why should I be forced 
to retain all my items and not have the freedom. Like I bought my bike, why can't I have the freedom to sell that bike to somebody else if it were a virtual bike? That's my argument here. And that, I think, is what's happening this in the last year. The cat is out of the bag where people are realizing that people, you can do this now, right? Um, and don't take my word for it. Like, this is what's happening, right? There is this gray market. I'm sure you've heard of uh, player auctions and game flip where you can buy in-game uh, items kind of on the gray market, right? It's, it's against the T's and C's, the terms and conditions of the games, um, but they're still there, right? And in fact, there was a study a couple of years ago uh, by a university in Korea which uh, measured the uh, size of the secondhand trading market, the, the gray market uh, for trading of in-game items um, in MMO games. And it estimated, or it measured, that uh, there was around about 20% of the, of the game's um, economy was locked up in this um, gray market of games. So for every 5 million that was spent in the game, 1 million was being spent in this gray market outside, which was not being monetized by the game creator. It was like dead money in that sense. The other thing is the metaverse. Why would you want to own an NFT? No one knows what the metaverse is, right? And, but I think beyond this idea of like fancy virtual VR goggles and, and Mark Zuckerberg with his fancy videos, um, I think what the metaverse is going to be is, is how we present ourselves and what is our digital identity in the future internet, right? And I think part of that is how we present ourselves is what we own, right? So I've turned up here dressed fairly casually, right? I came on the tube. Had I turned up in a Ferrari and stepped out in a sharp Armani suit, you would think of me differently, right? Because I'm presenting myself in a different way. And I think the metaverse is going to be, or a key component of the metaverse is going to be how we present ourselves. In, that, in, the, in these, these attributed spaces that we might, may or may not be playing in, right? So I think what we own, and NFTs are obviously a part of that, what we initially are a big thing of that. And the final and the weakest point, I think, actually, for why to own an NFT is the idea you might make money out of it. I say it's the weakest point, but it's the one that's made the most impact in the last year, and it's perhaps one of the reasons that people don't like NFTs. Um, obviously, actually, Infinity's made, have, had a, had a, you know, a, a, it's been a great hit. It's made a lot of money. It's quite a fun game. Um, I think it's fair to say that one of the reasons the people that play it is they think they can make money out of it, right? And this leads really to like um, <clears throat> why some people think NFTs are, are the devil's spawn, are, are not the future, and are bad for the industry. And that's because um, the idea of play to earn, which is great in, in many respects, I think it can work in the short term. Axie Infinity's made it work. I know there are lots of people here working on, on uh, play to earn or play and earn games. But I think that the speculation only makes sense uh, in the short term, right? And the reason is, is that you have this pyramid of buyers and sellers, right? Um, and the buyers are coming in below uh, and they're buying things from the sellers and the sellers are making money. But that only works as a model if there is this never ending flow of buyers, as soon as this arrow at the bottom slows down, then the whole economy collapses. And so an economy based on speculation, maybe it works in the short term, right? But I'm not sure it's gonna work in the long term. So how can we address these weaknesses and, and, and also uh, take advantage of the strengths of this new technology, these new approaches? One way that we're doing it in Freeverse is, is the idea of dynamic NFTs. We call them living assets, where what the, act, what the gamer does with their NFT actually affects their properties and therefore affects the market value, right? So how I'm using my NFT again in the game affects how much someone is willing to pay me for to, uh, if I want to sell it, right? And this turns this idea of a, of a passive activity of just collecting and speculating on NFTs into this active experience of engaging with them. Let's run through, some, run through some examples very quickly, right? Uh, imagine that I buy an asset for some money. It's a three-star asset. I spend some days or weeks playing with the asset to upgrade it, level it up like we do all the time with games. And then I can sell it on the market. And the market value will represent the effort that I have put into using it rather than just me sitting on it and hoping that uh, speculation as to its rarity will push the price up. Um, the other option is the Tamagotchi mechanic. We actually made at Freeverse a, a sort of a proof of concept game called Goal Revolution. It was an MMO football manager game where your football players were NFTs. And they automatically started getting less and less fit and performing less well in the game if you didn't come back and keep training them. Now, that's a very strong retention mechanic, right? Because you're incentivizing gamers to come back to make use of their assets they have in the game, but also you're incentivizing them that they don't lose money, right? Because the money. Um, the, the value of the NFT is being based on how or, or how often they're being used, right? And in fact, we saw some crazy high retention values 
uh, when we soft launched that game with only a few thousand users, admittedly, but uh, some crazy high retention values. And I think user-generated content is really a huge thing, right? I'm very proudly from South Wales. Uh, if I buy a Ferrari in a game and I choose to custom paint that Ferrari in the Welsh Dragon flag, spending my time and effort to do so, um, why shouldn't I be able to settle on somebody else, right? And somebody, uh, another Welsh person in the, in the crowd here might want to buy it from me and then customize it further, right? And I think this rise of, of UGC, of user generated content is really, really important. And I think it's something that's really possible by dynamic NFTs or living assets. So in summary, uh, I think what the user does with their NFTs is crucial to the long-term success, like to be able to convert user actions into something of value uh, and rather than just speculation. I think this makes it fairer. It makes it fairer for the gamer, makes it fairer for the company, and makes it fairer for all the stakeholders involved with, with that NFT and also in the metaverse. And I also think that as a games industry, new ways of driving retention uh, for your game and also new monetization models are, are very, very interesting, especially when they are enabling you to charge a recurring revenue on, those, on that gray market, which is currently being locked away. That's what we do at Freeverse. Um, we have a platform for uh, creating millions of NFTs, allow you to charge recurring revenue. They're very eco-friendly. They use very little energy. Uh, you can trade them in crypto or fiat. And most importantly, what the gamer does with them is reflected in their properties, and they can evolve based on how the gamer used them. Um, NFTs are definitely a Marmite moment, uh, but uh, there's nothing better than a good debate to see if you like it or not. We're here in the, um, uh, on the same floor as this uh, talk here. We've got to stand, and we'll be here later on. So if you want to come and debate it, uh, we're happy to do so. Thank you very much for your time today.